This week, we're gonna kind of focus on garden pesticides and safety. This is a super popular topic with a lot of growers. They always have questions about what products they wanna spray, what's safe to spray, what'll hurt the bees, what'll hurt their pets, their babies, whatever <laughs> they have in their yard. And that's a super valid question. So we're definitely gonna cover a lot of that information. So within integrated pest management, when I talk about it, I like to break it down into four categories. We talk about cultural control. We talk about mechanical control, biological control, and then lastly is chemical control. So again, for this meeting, we're gonna kind of zone in and focus on all things chemical control within integrated pest management. And usually for gardeners and even farmers, chemical control is kind of the last method they want to implement. So first you want to like look at that cultural control method because that's something you can implement on your farm to monitor for pests all year long. Um, mechanical control is using like a physical barrier, traps, or something to prevent the pest. And then of course, biological control is the use of natural enemies to control pests. But what we're gonna talk about again is chemical control, which is the use of chemicals. So within chemical control, we have synthetic pesticides, and then we have organic pesticides. So, Synthetic pesticides, these are um, products that are human made, they're in a laboratory. Basically, they're chemically joined compounds or elements. So examples I posted, a lot of the ortho brand products, Garden Tech 7 is a super common one that growers will use. And then BioAdvance, this used to be called Bayer, but they rebranded to BioAdvance. So, if you ever hear someone talk about BioAdvance, that's kind of the new product name for Bayer. But again, a lot of these products are called synthetic pesticides because they're not naturally occurring chemicals. And then on the other hand, we have pesticides that are considered organic. And they're considered organic because they're derived from plant, animal, or naturally occurring rock or petroleum oil sources. So some super common ones that people like to use is neem oil, which is used for a lot of pests. Um, pyrethrums, which I think is a product based from flowers. Sulfur, obviously, copper. And then if we wanna break that down even more, within organic pesticides, there's something called biological pesticides. And I gave this its own group because there's just quite a few, but essentially it's a subset of organics that specifically refers to products developed from naturally occurring microbial agents. It's like bacteria, virus, or fungi. Fungi, And I think the most common one that growers use is BT, which is super effective on larvae or caterpillar pests. So I listed some products down here as well. And then lastly, we have insect growth regulators. These kill insects by interfering with their normal process of juvenile development. We'll call them IGRs. So they'll disrupt the insect's hormonal process or its exoskeleton development. So a lot of like commercial pest control companies will use this for like cockroaches, um, fleas and ticks. So again, just to review, within chemical control, we have synthetic pesticides, organic pesticides, which can include biological pesticides, and then insect growth regulators. So now I wanna talk about just kind of a general summary of what a pesticide is and how it works. And we call that the mode of action. So every pesticide is grouped into a certain mode of action, which I'll talk about here in a second. But essentially the mode of action is the way a pesticide works, specifically how it'll affect the target site within an org organism. So that's typically like a critical protein or enzyme within that insect. And a lot of pesticide products, I kind of listed them here on the right side. 
but you'll find them as a liquid. So they can be sold in like a spray bottle or they'll be sold as a concentrate. So that's something you have to mix in with water into a sprayer. They can be sold as like a granular dust where the insect comes in contact, or it can be sold as a bait. And then this bottom picture is um, NOLO bait, which is common, commonly used for grasshoppers. So when we break down mode of action, there's four different kind of categories, if you will. The first one is um, pesticides that affect the nerves and muscles of an insect. So most current insecticides that you're buying on the market today um, falls under this category because it targets their muscles. So these um, are really fast acting. So like if you're spraying something on that caterpillar and then it's jolting around, that's usually because it's affecting its nervous system. The next one falls along the lines of like those insect growth regulators we talked about. Um, this mode of action affects the insect's development because it's controlled by that juvenile hormone and it's kind of affecting the, its skin and growth. And these ones are usually a lot more slower acting because they occur over a long period of time. Um, the next one is respiration. Um, a lot of insecticides are known to like interfere with the mitochondrial respiration. So like when that insect breathes it in almost, and it affects kind of that electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation, <laughs> whatever that word is. And then such insecticides are generally fast acting. So these are effective ones. And then the last category I want to talk about is the mid gut. So these are usually specific to lepidopteran species. So these are like the larvae of different cat or the larvae or caterpillars of different moths. And it's usually like a microbial toxin that is sprayed or it's expressed in like a GMO crop variety. So I think a common example is BT corn has that um, BT gene expressed in it. So when I think it's the European corn borer eats that corn, it's unable to adjust and that's what ultimately kills that insect. So again, just to review, when we talk about mode of action, Definitely remember this. It's the way a pesticide works, specifically how it affects the target site within an organism. And it's typically a critical protein or enzyme of the insect. And again, that can be the nervous and muscles, the growth, the respiration, or the mid gut. So here's kind of just a breakdown chart of the mode of action. Whatever pesticide product you buy, it'll give you a number. And essentially all mode of actions are organized by the main group. So example, mode of action one, I have it listed here of what its main group is. And then it has a chemical subgroup. So 1A is carbamates. And then subgroup 1B is organophosphates. And then each of these has an active ingredient. So carborol is a common active ingredient within pesticides. And malathion is another product. And then again, I have some products below listed. So whenever you, I'll talk about this in a second, but whenever you look at the label, you wanna see what that active ingredient is. So now I just kinda of wanna kinda of go over briefly about product labels. And as a gardener or farmer, it's super important that you read and understand the labels. They'll tell you everything you need to know about what the product is, how to apply it, what crops you can use it on, what insects it controls, all the safety information. So it's definitely your responsibility as the person using the pesticide to understand what you're using and how to safely use it. So I just picked out Garden Tech 7 because that's a super common label that a lot of growers have. So the first one you'll see is the brand name, which is Garden Tech. And then the trade name is seven. So this is like the name of the product or the manufacturer. And a lot of products or a lot of brands will use the same active ingredient, but they'll market it, market it different. So it's just kind of important to understand. Um, you'll see kind of the warning labels. So 
though they should probably all say definitely keep out of reach of children. But a lot of times we'll see a signal word and it can be either danger poison and that's usually the highest level because that's usually accompanied by a red skull and crossbones. So that means it's super fatal and probably the most restrictive. The next level is danger and then warning, which means it's moderately toxic and can cause moderate eye or skin irritation. And then caution is probably the lowest level. But regardless, no matter what the warning is, you should always be extremely careful with them. And then the net contacts or the net contents will tell you how much is in that product. So then when you open up the label, you'll see a first aid category. we will talk about kind of the symptoms you might experience and what you need to do. Um, the pre precautionary statements. This part of the label indicates specific hazards, routes of exposure, and precautions to be taken to avoid human and animal injury based off the signal word. And then directions for use. This is probably, this is among, with everything else, this is also super important. This will explain exactly how to use the product. And then storage and disposal. That's another super important thing to understand. Okay. And then I want to talk about this too. So pre-harvest intervals um, is the number of days required after the last application before the treated plant can be harvested. So on brassica vegetables, it says one day. So if I use this product on my broccoli, one day needs to pass before I can harvest that broccoli. Or it looks like most of these are one day use. But again, it depends on the active ingredient in the product. And usually these labels are several pages long. You can find the labels on the product themselves or you can find them online on the website. And again, I wanna emphasize that it's super important to first understand the pests that you're trying to control, and then two, make sure the crop that you're using this product on is allowed or it will be effective. Because a lot of times I'll get growers asking about a product they're using, and then when I research it, I'll find out like one, that product's not registered for that crop, nor is it effective for the insect that they're trying to use it on. So again, here's some more, here's another example of the label talking about all the type of insects that it'll control. Cool. So if you guys have any questions about that, feel free to comment in the chat. So I'm gonna give the time over to Dr. Michael Werda. He'll introduce himself and he'll dive more into all things pesticides. All right, I'll work on sharing my screen while you check and see if you have any questions. Okay. Do that. Awesome, you're set. All right. Um, okay. All right, so uh, first off, uh, thanks for everybody coming and Nick, thanks for creating this. this is a fun way to get to have these kind of conversations. A um, couple things to let everyone know. Um, my name is Dr. Dr. Michael Weirda. You don't have to use the doctor part, that's fine. Michael Weirda is fine. <laughs> um, my contact information is there on the page. I am the pesticide safety guy. Um, I'm not the pro-pesticide guy. I'm not the anti-pesticide <laughs> guy. I am the safe use of pesticides guy. Um, so if you have any questions about how to use a pesticide safely, I'm the guy to contact. Um, you can also contact Nick. He has a fairly good uh, amount of knowledge on this topic too, especially in, in home gardens. Um, secondly, there is a, a USU Extension PSEP, Pesticide Safety Education page. Um, you can easily find that on Facebook. Um, just search USU PSAP or USU Pesticide Safety or USU Pesticide and you'll end up on the page. 
um, without any problems. So with that, um, let's get into this a little bit. Um, first things first, um, it's important to understand that everything comes with a hazard. Um, anything you work with is potentially hazardous um, and you need to be mindful of what you're working with. Nick was absolutely right in saying that you need to read your labels, wear your appropriate PPE and all that sort of stuff. Um, what I'm gonna do is talk about pesticide safety for approximately one slide, and then we're gonna transition into looking at the safety, the, the hazard efficacy and cost of using a homemade vinegar salt soap solution versus a store-bought Roundup product. Um, so first thing, I have a question for you guys and I, I'd like you to vote with your comments and Nick, you can let us know if they come in and you see them because I will not at this moment. Um, what do you think is more hazardous? The, the organic product or the synthetic? product. So throw those votes in the comments, in the chats if you want to. Um, I'm going to ramble for just a minute um, about pesticide safety and a few things that uh, Nick mentioned. Um, you want to wear your PPE, you can always wear extra, as I said. Um, read your labels. If you're ever reading a label and you don't understand it, contact someone else um, and ask them. Um, somebody can help you make sense of it. Um, these things are not written for entertainment. I have to read sections multiple times over. Um, so, do we have any, oh, we don't need that. Did we get any votes? So we have about an even split between organic and synthetic. Okay, that's perfect. Because the answer is, like with so many other things, it depends. It depends on the particular chemical you're using the concentration and how much you get exposed. Um, a very simple example for uh, something that is organic that is not safe is cyanide. That is 100% organic and a very small amount will kill you. So not everything organic is safe. That said, not everything synthetic is more dangerous for you. Um, so it really helps to understand um, what you're working with and make sure you have your safety in line. So pesticide safety in one slide here, um, really it's about using IPM. I will always propose, be a proponent of IPM. IPM is basically applying the scientific method to pest management. Um, you identify and know the biology of your pest so you notice something. You monitor and survey the pest so you make um, recognition of a need. Then you set up your goals, whether it's prevent, suppress, or eradicate. Um, that's basically experimental design. Then you implement, same thing in both cases. And then you evaluate. You look to see, did we have an effect? Have the numbers gone down? Do we see a correlation in our research data? And then what do you do at the end of every scientific study? You reevaluate, reassess, and then reapply. Um, and that's what you do with IPM. You look at it, you recognize a problem, you develop a plan, you implement, you review, and then you go back and start again. Um, if pesticides are used, which they are used in IPM, um, again, read the label. The label is a legal document. If you go off label, you are violating federal law and you can get in trouble for that. Um, so read your labeling and make sure you follow it. And then always wear your appropriate PPE. That's at least the fifth time I've mentioned PPE in three minutes. Um, wear that PPE. Um, and remember, you can always wear more. What's on the label is the minimum. I used to have a war against wisteria when I lived in South Carolina every spring. And I would spray a boatload of Roundup on those plants. And I wore a Tyvek suit when I did it. Not required by the label, but I figured why not wear it to keep it off of me and keep it out of my house. All right, oh, I can't do that. How about that? All right, so let's get into this guy. Glyphosate versus vinegar, also known as synthetic versus natural, also known as evil industry versus home remedy. So we've all heard about glyphosate. Um, it's everywhere, it's used all the time. 
Um, so I wonder what your gut reaction is again. So this is another type it in the comments. Um, and let's just start with, let's go with one of those three questions. Which is safer? Which do you feel is safer in your gut reaction? Do you think the glyphosate mixture that's made in industry and synthetic is safer? Or do you think the vinegar that you buy at the grocery store and mix up with salt and salt is the safer version? So while those are coming in, and I'll check with you here shortly, Nick, let's talk about what hazard is. A um, couple of things we need to do to have this conversation is one, define hazard as it stands in the toxicology world. And then also talk a little bit about what LD50 means. Um, a lot of you have seen LD50, I suspect, um, but those are the measures that we're gonna compare. So we want to, uh, we wanna see, we wanna understand what we're talking about. So hazard with anything that you work with is its toxicity not work handle is its toxicity times its exposure so something that is not very toxic but you have an incredibly high exposure to can be just as hazardous as something that is extremely toxic that you have a very low exposure to um, and just to pin them down toxicity is the capacity to do injury exposure is the amount of the pesticide that enters the body, enters you, because we're talking about your safety here. And then hazard is that risk or potential for injury. But when you're working with these things, the hazard equals the toxicity times exposure, and exposure is the one thing that you can control. You can't control the toxicity of the product, you can control the exposure of the product. To look at a couple of examples real quick, um, gasoline, very toxic. Not good for you to breathe, not good for you to drink, not good for you to bathe in. But the system we work with keeps our exposure incredibly low. Aspirin is a low toxicity, but there's a very high exposure rate. So you can get really high exposure to a lot of aspirin and then that low toxicity becomes a problem, especially in smaller animals like children. If a child got a hold of a bottle of aspirin and ate most of it, that's a problem. If a grown adult does it, not quite as bad, but still not good for you. All right, so the fun part, the LD50. So LD50 stands for lethal dose at which 50% of the test population was killed. So, LD50 is usually measured in milligrams per kilograms. And the way these studies are done is you have a research population, could be um, ducks, could be fish, could be um, frogs, all sorts of animals get used for this sort of stuff. Um, and then you dose them with X amount of milligrams per kilogram of their body weight. And then you see how much it takes to kill half of your population. LC50, same thing, just in a solution. So the concentration of the active ingredient in the solution. So to take an example real quick, we have three vats. Let's say we have tadpoles in them and we are doing a 48 hour um, toxicity study. So we have three vats, each one of them has 100 tadpoles in it. We put 100 milligrams, 10 milligrams and one milligram per kilogram uh, into those. And if, because I'm using a water example, that should actually be parts per million. So 100 parts per million, 10 parts per million, and one part per million. We let it go for that 48 hours, and then we come back and we find that our death rates are this. We had 96 in the one in the 100 parts per million, 50 in the 10 parts per million, and one or 12 in the one parts per million which means our LC50 for this study is 10 parts per million. I know it says milligrams per kilogram, but I went with an aquatic example, so we have to adapt. Um, so that's the LD50s and LC50s. These are the numbers that are used to extrapolate out um, what kind of exposure levels are reasonable for people working with products and stuff like that also. So what's our, what's our vote looking like? Any guesses? Any, any trends you see? So the majority of people think vinegar is safer. Okay. 
Awesome. All right. So let's talk about let's talk about all of them their things. So the vinegar mixture is typically a half gallon of vinegar, a half a cup of salt, and two tablespoons of soap. So that's our vinegar mixture. Um, if we look at efficacy, which is one of our things we want to compare, our two pesticides are two very different things. They have two different ways of affecting the organism. Um, glyphosate is what we call a systemic pesticide. It's taken up, transported throughout the plant, and kills throughout. Contact is what our vinegar is. So vinegar and salt both have um, uh, herbicidal tendencies. Um, but they are only contact herbicides, so they only affect the plant where they come in contact. So if you're trying to kill the plant roots and all, you're not going to be successful with the contact herbicide, the vinegar salt herbicide, pardon me. If we look at annuals um, and or perennials, if that's what you're trying to control, um, again, the systemic is going to kill roots and all. Going to get to the unseen parts, the contact, only where it contacts. So if you're using the vinegar, you have to have complete coverage. But if you're using the vinegar salt solution, plants in near proximity aren't as big of a concern. Um, you don't have to worry as much about a few drops of the salt vinegar solution getting on the neighboring plant. It won't necessarily, it won't be taken up by the plant, transported throughout and cause damage elsewhere. However, the proximity situation you can run into with the vinegar salt is as you keep adding this to your plants and it builds up in your soils, you can get salt buildup in your soil, which can be a problem. And then non-target exposure, both of these herbicides are non are uh, non-specific. So any plant they get on, they will damage. So efficacy-wise, they're just very, very different, really. Um, the systemic glyphosate will kill roots and all. Um, the contact will only kill the part at contact. So it's a little more work working with that product or working with that solution. Oop, too fast. So how do they work? So this is the mode of action um, that Nick mentioned just a little while ago. So for acetic acid, the mode of action is it strips away the, mac the, waxy, the waxy protective layer, the cell wall, and then it disrupts the cell membrane and causes desiccation, cell death, and ultimately plant death in the areas it makes contact. A thing worth noting about um, the acetic acid is the way that it disrupts cell membranes in plants, it can do the same thing to your cell membranes. Your cell membranes and a plant cell membranes are not that different. So you can have the same uh, disruption of tissue and even drying out and stuff like that if you get too much on you, which is why there's usually something about gloves on those labels. Glyphosate is actually designed to block an amino acid pathway that only exists in plants, fungi, and bacteria. So an amino acid pathway is a pathway that builds proteins and then the proteins are used for other things in the body. Um, glyphosate actually causes uncontrolled growth. So the amino acid pathway it blocks is a pathway that um, controls the growth rate. And when that gets blocked, they grow out of control, which is why they get that weird cupping. So it's worth noting that the gene that is inhibited by glyphosate does not exist in the mammalian genome. So it's not possible for glyphosate as designed to affect mammals. I'm not saying it's safe. It comes with a caution label for a reason. Um, and the caution label is somewhat due to the fact that it's acidic. Um, most of your Roundup glyphosate mixtures are an acidic mixture, and that's why they come with eye protection warnings and stuff like that. So those are our two modes of action. Um, one is very general, damages cell membranes. The other is very specific and blocks a specific amino acid pathway. I keep trying to use my arrows, but they won't. All right, so if we look at cost, 
So if you buy a gallon of herbicide concentrate, a roundup of sorts, I did a Google a while back, maybe about a year ago when I put this slide deck together and found a jug for about $27. You take about 2.5 fluid ounces of that concentrate, put it into one gallon of water, which means your one gallon of ready to spray Roundup mixture costs you about a buck and five cents. The herbicide mixture will cost you about $2 or almost $3 for a jug of white vinegar. You might find it cheaper at Costco, I don't know. Um, about 27 cents in table salt, another quarter for dish soap, bringing the cost of a one gallon ready to go vinegar mixture to $3.30. That means our homemade herbicide mixture is about three times as expensive as the store-bought glyphosate product, the Roundup product. But, you know, spending extra money to be safe is a good move. Um, we all, uh, buy those cars with airbags for a reason. All right, let's look at toxicity. Um, most everybody uh, thought that the acetic acid or the vinegar would be safer um, and less toxic. Um, if we look at our LD50 50 concentrations, you can see here that glyphosate has an LD50 of 4,837, acetic acid 3,310, and then sodium about 3,000. Now understand, when we talk about this, we're talking about the acetic acid in the jug, not 3,310 milligrams per kilogram of white vinegar, 3,310 milligrams per kilogram of acetic acid. Um, so that said, nonetheless, acetic acid and sodium chloride both have a lower LD50, which means they are more toxic, so less of it can have a problem, can lead to uh, death, lead to death in uh, rats through oral exposure. Um, so that, um, just to get you the idea, um, it's not actually less toxic. Sodium and acetic acid are more toxic than glyphosate to rats via an oral exposure, so eating it. Um, just to put some more numbers of them, some things that come into your life on a daily basis, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, so if you're looking to work with less toxic, uh, the homemade herbicide is not your best choice. And then these are just a couple uh, different, more numbers from the Toxological Data Network. Um, caffeine has an LD50 of 192 milligrams per kilogram. And aspirin, yeah, that's what's behind there. Um, aspirin also right around 200 milligrams per kilogram. We all drink caffeine every day. Well, we, not all of us, I do, maybe you do too. Um, but again, know this, this is talking about caffeine, pure caffeine. So scoops of caffeine, not cups of coffee. But nonetheless, caffeine and aspirin are both drastically more toxic, have much lower LD50s than any of these herbicides that we're talking about today. And then exposure wise, um, again, exposure is where you have your control. So this is how you can control how much of this toxic stuff gets on you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, going back to our math a couple slides ago, two and a half fluid ounces of concentrated uh, glyphosate into a one gallon jug leads to about 0.07 pounds of glyphosate. Turn that into milligrams, that's 31,752. Um, vinegar, I'm gonna hide this so I can see it, um, has 0.44 pounds of acetic acid in the jug, which is 1,982,220 1 milligrams. So the concentrate of the acetic acid in a one gallon ready to spray vinegar solution is six times the concentration of glyphosate in a one gallon ready to spray mixture. So again, if your goal is to put less chemistry into the environment, i.e. into yourself, onto your dog, onto your cat, anything, um, the homemade herbicide isn't your best choice because there's a lot more of that active ingredient 
in the homemade herbicide than there is active ingredient in the uh, commercial product. Um, a note worth making as I uh, get close to wrapping this guy up, um, somebody out there is probably pulling their hair out and saying, but herbicidal vinegar works much better. Um, it's true, but you have to be a commercial pesticide applicator to get your hands on herbicidal vinegar. Um, herbicidal vinegar comes with a 10 to 20% concentration of acetic acid versus the 5% that is in the um, white vinegar that we've been talking about. Can't use that button still. Um, so just to sum this stuff up, hold on, sorry. Um, so our comparisons that basically show the homemade vinegar herbicide is more toxic, it is applied at higher rates, i.e. you have a higher exposure to it. It's less effective in that it's not a systemic herbicide, it's only a contact herbicide, and it's more expensive than a commercial herbicide like glyphosate. Now it's worth noting, and I pointed this out at the beginning, um, there are risks with using any herbicide, including your organic herbicides. Um, you should not be complacent when using household chemicals, um, such as vinegar for weed control. You should be making sure you're staying safe and wearing the appropriate PPE. And then also, when used appropriately with that appropriate personal protective equipment, both of these herbicides can be applied with relative safety.